In this episode, I talk about the rules of pen etiquette, getting into nibmeistering, and the blackest of the blackings. Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here at GouletPens.com, and it's episode number 157 of Goulet Q&A. And I gotta say, I have been running the Q&As really long lately, and I've had a crazy day today, and it's like the tail end of the day, and I just don't have as much time to shoot it today. So I'm gonna kind of blow through at a much quicker pace than I normally do for this episode. So that said, I'm just gonna kind of get into it. Um, weather's been crazy here. We've had some new products. Uh, Monteverde gemstone inks have arrived this week. That's kind of cool. We got a lot of new stuff. I mean, a ton of new stuff that's lined up for March. I talked about a lot of them last week. Some of the things that are gonna be kind of first to come is Visconti Brunelleschi is gonna be coming probably in the next week or so. Pelican M405 Struzman kind of nice. Um, it's been out for a couple of months, but it's going to be new to us. That pen is going to be coming here in the next maybe week, we can have something like that. Further down the road, we got the Traveler's Notebook and Olive, Stipula Passaporto, Twisby Mini All Blue, and the VAC 700R, um, the Platinum Classic inks. A lot of these things are all stuff that's in our coming soon page on our website. So I would recommend that you go check that out. It's a bunch of things I left out as well, but I am moving along today. First question I have is from Carl K on Facebook. Um, are there any hard and fast rules, i.e. do's and don'ts, regarding pen etiquette when someone asks to examine my fountain pen or my examining theirs? I'm not sure I want someone trying out my pen. Would it endanger my nib? So I would say this is gonna vary depending on who you ask. I don't think there's any real hard and fast rules about what is pen etiquette. I've seen everything from, you know, kind of this, uh, I'll call it a traditional mentality of a pen is very, a fountain pen especially is very individual to you. The nib conforms to your own writing. And if you even hand it over to someone for one signature, it will change the whole way that it writes and yada, yada, yada. I don't really ascribe to that so literally like that. I definitely believe that if you're handing a pen over to somebody and they have no idea what they're doing and they mash that nib down, yes, they can ruin it and they can change the way that that pen writes. But really think about it. It's a metal nib with stainless steel or gold or something like that that's meant to last for decades of writing. And if you hand it over to somebody and they write just a normal, in normal writing, they write one line of their signature, is that really gonna change it that much? I don't think so. That's just not practical for me. Um, I do believe that um, a pen feels different for every single person. And depending on how you hold it, um, it can change it. And I know that over time, you know, the writing pressure that you use and the angle that you hold it and stuff can get a pen to kind of wear in certain spots to where it will not write the same depending on the angle that you hold it and stuff. Say you have been using a pen for five years very consistently. You might wear a little spot on that nib where it's uh, it's that's your specific spot. And if somebody else holds it, it's not gonna feel exactly the same. I do believe that, but I don't think it's the kind of thing like if you hand it over to somebody, it's just never gonna write the same again. I think I think uh, we as individuals conform to the writing of our pens more than our pens conform to our writing. Unless you get like a custom nib grind or something like that, that's very drastic. But um, what my approach, you know, whenever I have somebody that's interested in fountain pens, if they have no idea what they're doing, I always give just a little bit of a spiel about how to hold it, you know, specifically talking about the um, writing pressure, not pressing with a lot of pressure, you know, holding the pen angle a little bit lower because I think the tendency when you have a, a, a ballpoint or a rollerball pen is to hold it very vertical and press down a lot, um, but that's not the case. So I, I you know, had tell them of the nib pointing up, you know, holding the pen angle of 45 degrees and then writing with very little pressure. And that's usually enough for somebody. And at that point, usually they're like, uh, never mind, I don't feel comfortable with it. And then that's when I'm like, all right, fine, you probably shouldn't be writing with it anyway, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, just a little bit of instruction like that and a little bit of encouragement for somebody, they'll get to write with it and they'll be like, oh, wow, look at how smooth it is. Oh, that's a really cool color. And it kind of gets them into it. But, you know, if somebody's just like grabbing a pen and they're like, ah, how does this work? A lot of times, I've handed it to people and they've had the nib completely upside down and it's just like, nope, that's okay, the nib goes like that. 
Um, sometimes people need uh, some encouragement in that way, um, but I haven't found it to be like such a great risk, you know, handing a pen over to somebody. Now, if it's something like a you know seven hundred dollar Visconti or something like that, then I would maybe be a little more cautious. But if it's somebody that especially knows pens. You know, I wouldn't sweat it too much. Just maybe a little bit of instruction, whatever I feel comfortable with. And that's kind of where I'll leave it is it's really up to you and whatever you feel comfortable with, with your pens, your, you know, investment that you have in that individual pen and your trust of the other person and how they've been able to communicate that trust back as far as how they're going to take care of it. So there are no real hard and fast rules. I just think a little bit of instruction and then, you know, kind of staying with them and walking them through it as they're starting to write with it for the first time uh, would go a long way. Next question is from Melissa R on Facebook. If you were to get a nib ground to something new that you've never tried before, um, I personally want to try an architect grind. What nib would you use? Something replaceable in case you don't like the grind, like a Lamy nib or a Goulet, something lower price, or maybe something less replaceable on a pen that you love in hopes of ending up with a really awesome pen. I think that's a great question, and um, it's you know I don't think a lot of people are getting custom nib grinds um, in the grand scheme of things, but I think it's something that interests and intrigues a lot of folks. There's not a lot of nib meisters out there, and most of them are very very busy. Um, so for a custom nib grind, something like an architect grind, it's going to be a little more expensive because it's a little more difficult of a grind. You're probably looking forty to sixty dollars, something like that, depending on the nibmeister. Again, I don't offer that service here, but I've seen others that do, um, and it's it's a little bit of time. It takes a lot of practice to get it right, um, and then of course there's a risk involved when you're talking about doing it on expensive pens. So you're going to want to use somebody that's got some experience doing it, and I think most nibmeisters who are doing special grinds and things like that um, probably have their preferences as to which pens kind of take that grind the best, especially when it comes to certain nib sizes and you know certain grinds. Say you want like an, ob an oblique or some, uh, you know, an architect grind or something, it might not be as easy to do on certain nib sizes and certain nib types because, you know, fountain pen companies, they'll have uh, different amounts of tipping material on the nib, depending on the size, depending on the pen model even. Um, and I know some pens are more conducive to certain grinds than others. Um, and a nib meister is going to have that experience and that expertise to be able to tell you that. So you might see, you know, for example, I've seen, you know, architect grinds uh, on Lamy 2000s fairly regularly, you know, so that might be, if you're seeing a lot of people getting architect grinds on Lamy 2000s, you might want to reach out to that nibmeister and say, hey, you know, I want to get an architect grind, can I do it on Lamy 2000? And they would say, that's a perfect pen for it, yes, you should do it, or that's not the ideal pen, here's what I recommend. So I would recommend them as a resource because I think that would be a, a great way to because they're the one doing the custom grind. They're going to know what they're comfortable with. But really kind of this philosophical thing of should I do it on a cheap pen in case I don't like it, kind of hedge my bets thinking I'm not going to like it, or should I really invest in a pen like a Lamy 2000 or higher thinking that I'm going to love this grind and then I'm going to have it on a pen that I really love and want to use for a long time. I think that's really up to you. Keeping in mind the grind is probably 40 to 60 bucks anyway. So if you're thinking of kind of a throwaway nib, well, you're already investing a lot in the grind itself. So I would think more of, okay, if I don't absolutely love it, could I maybe learn to love it or would I want to resell it? And I think if you're going with, you want to resell it and maybe recoup some of that investment back, because I do think you would be able to do that, um, you would want to do that on a little nicer pen and, and maybe one that's a little more in demand. So I think if, say, I'm just using this example of, you know, a, a, say a Lamy nib versus a Lamy 2000, like a Lamy stainless steel nib, which is only, you know, 1350, um, but then with a custom grind, that nib becomes, who knows, 50, 60, 70 dollars. That's going to be a harder resell to somebody um, than it would, say, a Lamy 2000 with an architect grind. You may be able to sell the Lamy 2000 with an architect grind as a used pen for, I don't know, probably like a full retail price and just, you know, you'd have to eat the grind. So I think you would be able to recoup much of that back having that grind on a nicer pen. So that's kind of the way I would lean, but you either way, when you go with a custom grind, you gotta be kind of committed into, I'm probably gonna like this. So that's more where I'd probably urge you, but it's really a personal choice. All right, I got a few ink questions this week. Um, this one is from The Nice Devil on YouTube. Can you buy ink concentrate? Is it possible to make ink powder and just put it in a bottle and add water? <laughs> sort of like a, you know, like powdered milk or something like that. Um, ink powder, not really. I mean, 
So ink itself is a liquid, you know, there's a number of components that go in it, um, but dye and water are the main components. And technically dye is, you know, in powder form, I believe in most cases, um, before it becomes a liquid. So um, technically you could have a dye powder that then you then put into liquid, but that's not really fountain pen ink, that's really just dye at that point. Um, so there's a number of other things, surfactants and um, other stabilizers and biocides and things like that that go into fountain pen ink that's gonna last a long time. Otherwise, you're essentially just kind of making food coloring, right? Like you're just having a powder with water in it and it's just kind of a dye. So not really is the answer. You know, perhaps there's some chemical way that you could kind of whatever, make an ink and turn it into like a crystal form or something that could then kind of like you have instant coffee that you could turn. But I'm willing to bet that that probably wouldn't be an easy thing to do. And I have never seen that uh, before. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure that's been out there anywhere. Um, but uh, you know, I don't think that that's necessarily an easy thing to do. I think the better way to go if you'd wanna have kind of a concentrated uh, ink that you then can I'll stretch out further or desaturate um, or whatever, just buy a really concentrated ink. Um, I know Noodler specifically is really concentrated inks, very vibrant colors, which is great, but you know, Noodler specifically, Nathan Tardif, the guy who creates that ink, um, has you know, openly promoted the dilution of his inks. He specifically fills his bottles to the absolute brim because he says he wants you to get the most bang for your buck. And he wants, and he even encourages you to dilute his ink to try to make it last as long as possible. He is very much into getting the most uh, ink for your dollar as possible um, as a manufacturer. So he's a big proponent of that. So a lot of his inks you could dilute 10, 15, 25, maybe even 50%. Of course, you would notice some desaturation at that point, but a lot of them you can desaturate, you know, even 25% and still have a pretty vibrant color. So you can stretch that ink out a little bit. I think that's probably gonna end up being your best route for what you're asking for. All right, this is from Agawi on Instagram, A-G-A dot W-Y on Instagram. Ink question, which is the darkest of them all? So this is the great, the great ink question, right? I've been asked this for years. Um, if you're talking all inks, I think the obvious answer would be black, would that would be the darkest of all inks, just that color is the darkest. Um, so you, it ends up turning into which is the blackest of the blacks, all right? Which is kind of what I said in the intro. So um, I think this is a point of debate. We have 40 different black colors or very close to it on gouletpens.com right now. So there's a lot and which is the exact blackest of the black is going to be up for a little bit of debate. Um, I have some of my top picks, but again, it's gonna vary a little bit depending on the pen that is used, the nib that, and how wet it is, the paper that's used as well. I think that the absorbency and properties of some of these inks can vary a little bit depending on the paper and stuff. So that's why I think there's debate is because there's a lot of you know factors involved, but um, the five that I'm choosing as kind of the blackest of the black inks that I could recommend. Um, one is Aurora Black, very wet black ink, very dark. Um, that is certainly one, very uh, no shading really at all in that one. Noodler's Black as well, very dark black ink. Uh, Noodler's Heart of Darkness as well, those two, Black and Heart of Darkness, are very much held in esteem together. Uh, Noodler's X Feather, that is a, an ink that's very similar to Noodler's Black, but it's a little bit thicker, uh, made to not feather quite as much on your paper. Um, very dark ink as well. And then uh, Jerobon Pearl Noir, I throw that one in there. I think that one is, um, you know, it's a very dark, very kind of wet ink as well. Not quite as thick as some of the other ones. It's very flowy, kind of more like Aurora Black. Um, but uh, and that one, you know, could probably be debated more than the other ones that I've said here. But I kind of threw that one in there because I feel like it, it deserves a mention. Um, but I'd be curious to know what you all think is the blackest of black inks as well. So you can leave that in the comments. It's not the question of the day, but um, we'll kind of throw that in there. Um, this is from Chinyan Pandya on Instagram. What are your thoughts on boiling the ink for a few seconds to evaporate some of the water and make it more saturated? Perhaps bring out a bit more of the sheen? Is it even possible? Waiting for your interesting insights. Uh, boiling it, uh, I gotta be honest, I have never heard of this before or thought about it. But you know, after you asked the question, I was kind of like, boiling it, interesting. Because it makes sense if you're trying to evaporate uh, the water out of the ink, could that work? Honestly, I think that if you were boiling it, 
you would probably be having some adverse effects of some kind that would um, change some of the composition of the ink uh, that may vary depending on which ink you're using. I don't think it would just boil off some of the water. I think you would end up changing some of the reactivity, some properties of the ink itself. So I don't think that's the route that I would go for this. You know, if you're talking about trying to just bring out more sheen, I don't know that just boiling it is gonna be the way that I would go, but I've never tried it. So I would be interested to try some experiments. I just have not done that before and realistically don't know when I would be able to do that anytime soon, but um, it's an interesting kind of idea. So, um, you know, one thing uh, that, I, that you can do um, to evaporate out some ink is to just unscrew it and just leave it sitting out for a while. Of course, you have to be concerned about contaminants in the air and stuff like that, but most inks have biocides and stuff that would help with that. But really, if you just leave the ink sitting out, just like if you have a pen and you leave it sitting for a long time, it kind of dries out. Well, you can do the same with a bottle of ink and it'll just, the water will evaporate out of it and the rest of the properties will stay behind. So, um, you know, it would probably be a day or two, depending on your climate and all this kind of stuff. If it's super humid out, it's not gonna happen as fast. If it's really dry, it's gonna happen more. Um, but you could unscrew the bottle and just leave it to air out and then the water would kind of evaporate out of it and you could keep an eye on it and when it drops down a bit you could try using it um, now when you do that you're going to end up with some property changes a little bit you know there's going to be a higher concentration of dye in there so it's not going to flow quite the same you got to take that into consideration the dry time is going to be different and some of these things so um, you know i don't know if the trade-off is going to be worth it you'd have to experiment and be willing to you know risk whatever amount of ink that you're experimenting with to see if that would happen but uh, um, i would say as far as bringing out sheen if it's a already a sheening ink maybe that could change the properties i don't know i've never tried that but uh, if it's an ink that isn't sheening already it's probably not going to cause it to sheen i think there's probably you know dye components and stuff involved in that ink that are necessary to be there in the first place to make it sheen so it's not like if you desaturate it you're automatically going to have sheen um, usually when you're getting sheen is from those inks that have a have a propensity to sheen anyway and it's just you're putting a really heavy amount of it on the page that's when you're getting um, that sheen effect i don't know if taking some of the water out of the ink would then cause it to sheen more it's a great question i did not have the time to scientifically experiment with that before answering this question but i think it's interesting if you have a scientific propensity and you want to try to experiment with this on some of your inks i'd be very curious to hear what some results are so i'll kind of leave that challenge out to you all in the pen community here and see if that happens um, but i think in general it's probably not going to be like the number one uh, way to go but i'd be kind of very curious to hear how it goes all right, and uh, I got a couple of business questions here. I really am rolling along today. <laughs> I'm making up for the last couple of weeks. I know last week was really long. Um, this is a business question from Matthew M. on Facebook. Do ink manufacturers ever have a problem with you repackaging and selling the ink as samples? I think this is a great question um, and really, really interesting. I don't know that I've ever been asked this. I um, actually had two different manufacturer reps come here today. That's part of why I'm rushing to get this done before the end of the days, because uh, they ran a little bit long, and you know, building those relations is very important. Um, but uh, anyway, so I met with two different ones who are both uh, have ink as part of uh, what we sell on their behalf. Um, and honestly, no, I've never had a problem with anybody about the fact that we sell samples. In fact, it's usually quite the opposite. I think most of them are like, oh, that's a really cool idea. You know, just kind of like you all in the pen community, you're like, oh, samples are a great idea. And it makes sense in, when you're buying paint or whatever. You know, it's like you get a sample before you commit to a whole thing. Um, it kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, I could understand where the, the thought would be, maybe they have a problem with it because it's not in the original packaging and are they really representing the blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, I think because of the way we do it, you know, it's great and they have a great idea, especially with the fact that we have the swab shop and we do so much to educate and then we provide the samples as well. So we're really representing presenting what the color is and then we have the sample so you get to try it and then you get to try full bottle so you know I think that uh, that kind of three-step process that we have uh, kind of put together here at Goulet is really good and I think that um, you know that was uh, we were kind of the first ones to, to kind of put all that together um, it's been working well for us for the last seven years it's a lot of work to do those samples that is for sure but um, you know it's really great and then you know the fact that we're authorized you know, retailers for all of our brands, I think they're happy with the efforts that we're doing there to try to um, get exposure for, for their colors as much as possible. You know, if you take a brand, we have, 
you know, f in the mid 500s, <laughs> as 500s as far as like ink colors that we have offered right now. So if you take your typical brand is between, you know, 10 and 30 colors, you know, that's, that's a portion of all the colors that we offer, you know, and, and you figure if we only had their bottles, we didn't have a swab, it was just their bottles, people were just going off the name, a lot of people would be hesitant to buy a full bottle of whatever the brand was. But the fact that we make have samples, it allows a lot of people to be able to try their brand of ink that normally wouldn't otherwise. So they're usually thrilled at the prospect of doing that. Not to mention the swabs and all this, we get good representation for all their colors. Um, on our site, so even those who aren't buying it, because you gotta think if it's a manufacturer or a distributor or something like that who, you know, we're only one of their customers as a single retailer. They might have a slew, hundreds, possibly thousands of retailers that are representing their brand across the country, across the world. The fact that we have a website and we display all this stuff and we allow a lot of different people to try samples, well, that is gonna spread goodwill about that brand across the whole world, potentially. So they love that fact that we're getting you know, possibly more of their ink into your hands as possible. So it actually ends up being the complete opposite. They absolutely love it and uh, it works out well for everybody. And then the last question for this week, um, man, I can really plow through when I try. Um, this is from Joshua W. An email. I was wondering how it would be best to look into Nibmeister work. I've done a little bit of antique watch repair at a friend's shop. Nothing professional, but helped him out a bit. And working on fountain pens sounds like a similar vein of work. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing you could take a course on, at least not here in the U.S. Any suggestions? Um, I've never done any watch work, but you know, it's definitely the same kind of like attention to detail and uh, that fine motor skills and stuff like that. It doesn't seem like a huge leap. Um, knowledge wise, it's completely different. But um, I could think as far as like those, those skills that would be required, I think it would be somewhat similar. Um, I think it would be a similar kind of thing if you do any like jewelry work or jewel setting or any of that kind of stuff. I think it wouldn't be a huge leap um, to get into nib work. Now, when you get into nib work, it's part science and part art. You know, it's truly a craft. So I think that there is a strong component of, you know, uh, education uh, and, you know, being trained as part of it, but some of it's going to be a skill set and just tons and tons of practice. So um, there's not, I'm not aware of any training, any school of any kind in the world that does Nibmeister training. I think it's just not common enough. Um, and it takes some time to be able to really learn that skill well. Um, and then, you know, and I just don't think it's a common enough thing for there to be really any formal training on it. In that way, long term, I'm a little concerned that it's kind of a dying art, a dying craft. Um, I think it's great that there are some people that are coming up and learning how to do it. But what I've seen, granted, I've only been around seven years in the pen world. That's not a vastly long time, especially when you're talking about nib work and that kind of craftsmanship mentality of it. You're talking like decades worth of work sometimes to really become, you know, that elite elite status and being able to mentor somebody. You know, you got to have a lot of practice, um, and you got to know a lot about pens. There's 150 years of fountain pen history around with who knows how many brands and different types and different nibs and all different kinds of stuff. There's a lot of depth. Even if you learn the base skills of how to do nib work, when you talk about you know pen repair, and which is not a far leap from nib work, and you talk about customization and different types of nibs and re-tipping and all this, boy, it gets deep really, really fast. I don't know really of any comprehensive books on the subject. There may be some really old ones around somewhere, but I don't have any to tell you right now because if I knew them, I would have them. Um, and I don't know of anyone that's actively like taking anyone under their wing in order to train either. So the people that I've seen that have kind of come up and, and are learning some of those skills are basically doing it by trial and error. Um, they're studying some, they're maybe talking to people in the pen industry if they can, but they're kind of just t taking it on as an enthusiast getting a bunch of nibs however they can and then just practicing and just doing it a bunch and then when they have the confidence and have the skills they start charging for it maybe do a pen show here and there try to get their name known a little bit and do the work just so that they can get practice on it now there's an element of risk involved with all of this because you're talking about you know 
voiding warranties with every pen that you're working on, basically. And you have to kind of build it up under your own name. And there's an element of risk involved, which is why I haven't gone that route. I mean, it's super appealing to me as a retailer to get into that work. But even as me being me and being in the industry, I have not been able to get the time with some of these folks to get some of the training, uh, even myself, with all the weight I've tried to pull in that way. So I would say that um, that's, uh, you know, a big kind of, you know, question mark as far as the best way to go about that. But those who I've seen that have come up in the last seven years that have been able to do it have really taken the initiative on themselves and been super passionate about doing it to where they just find it in, in any avenue that they can, usually by Googling it, talking to people, going to pen shows, talking to the nibmeisters at pen shows, and just seeing what information they can scrap together and then just trying it. And that's kind of how it's been working these days. So, um, that, yeah, I think. <laughs> I wish I had something better for you, but you know, there's some good resources like Richard Bender I know is a resource. He's trained up some folks, but he's not actively like training people on a regular basis. And, um, but he's, he's got a really good website. Um, you can check out richardspens.com. You can check out his site. He's got a ton of pen and historical information. He's got some eBooks as well. He's probably the best, um, you know, comprehensive like uh, written resource that I've seen that has kind of that pen information on there, especially pen repair and things like that. Um, that's been, that's been out there, and I know he's done some like nib uh, nib tuning workshops at some of the pen shows. Um, I've taken one myself uh, uh, from him at uh, you know it's like an hour and a half class, so you're not going to learn everything, but you get the basics. Um, so he's got some some information there that could at least get you started and see if you're interested in it. Um, I have no affiliation uh, with him at this point, but uh, you know, I know he's a resource there. Um, there's some retailer, not even retailers really, but uh, you know, manufacturers, obviously, pen manufacturers that do some in-house tuning. But man, you're talking like the people that have been doing that have been doing it for decades, and they're usually overseas, you know, outside of the U.S. Because you mentioned you're in the U.S., um, and they're usually not training people outside of the company. So you have to like work at the company and kind of do that somehow, work your way in there. So if it's something you're truly super passionate about, if you hit the grind and you are just out there and doing it and trying it yourself and really stick at it for a number of years, I think you will be able to get connected in with people who will be able to train you, but you're not going to be able to be like, oh, I'm interested in this. Let me take a, you know, nib tuning 101 class, you know, just like you would take a pottery class or something like that. It doesn't exist. You got to really, really want it and have some goods, have some skills, you know, to be able to do it long term and stick with it before you can really get some some kind of official training from the folks. Because, you know, it's a it's a very eccentric bunch who get into nib tuning. Um, and I say that with the utmost of love, um, you know, they are not just training anybody because they're usually so stinking busy, they don't have the time to train just anybody who's interested. And it's, you know, they will, they are much more on the like, well, if you don't really know what you're doing, then you're doing more harm than good. So they don't, they're kind of, there's, there's, there's a distrust almost a little bit about kind of the casual nib tuning you know, thing with with most of the nibmeisters I've talked to. So they want people who are really committed and really kind of know what they're doing, and then have done it for a long time before they really want to trade, you know, train over some of their skills. And that's just a very difficult place to be, and that's why there's not a lot of training going on. So I know I'm personally I'm kind of passionate about like cracking that nut. I want to see like how do we make that happen? How do we not have this craft die? How do we take this knowledge that's in some of these Nibmeister's heads who are reaching their 60s, 70s, 80s, how do we get this information and pass it on to a younger generation so that we can continue this on and continue doing some great stuff? So haven't figured that out yet, but I'm very interested in learning how to do it. So that's pretty much it for Q&A this week. Uh, definitely quicker than previous weeks. So kind of a compact, you know, kind of like the ink question. Like, you know, it's a more concentrated Q&A this week. Um, but my question of the week for this week is, how do you feel about loaning out your pens to people? What is your kind of process? Do you have one? Do you just like, I never want to give my pens out? Or are you like, Everybody needs to know about pens. I always keep five on me so I can give them to everybody I see. I would just love to hear kind of how you feel about that process. What's your pen pen evangelization, evangelization strategy, if you will? Uh, it'd be kind of cool to hear about. So just leave a comment on there. Um, I didn't talk about a lot of specific products this week. I actually think this might be one of the first Q&As in a long time. I haven't shown you a single product. 
um, other than the Metro that I whipped out here that I keep on my desk. But um, that's it for this week. You can check out a lot of products on GoulayPens.com and um, definitely ask some questions here. Um, we'll be uh, doing another Q&A next week um, and uh, we'll see if I, you know, do another shorty like this or if I, you know, split it. Maybe I'll kind of go back to 45. This is definitely, this is like more reminiscent of the early Q and A's where I was doing them for half an hour and I was like, man, these are getting long. Now I laugh because of how long they are these days, but I appreciate you being with me for all my ramblings. So I hope you have a great weekend and a great rest of your week. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching and right on.